Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. This is Brother Jerry Guto of Jubilee Celebration Center uh, here in New Jersey, uh, United States. Welcome to our series of um, presentations, sermons, and messages. We're grateful to the Lord. Where this is our Passover weekend, the best weekend or one of the most important weekends uh, in the year in our Christian calendar. This is the weekend of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have very good messages for you to listen to. Jesus is the Lamb of the Passover Lamb, and Jesus is our resurrection. So take a listen to this, and may the Lord bless you. Thank you. I want us to quickly move into the Word of the Lord tonight. Um, bearing in mind and knowing that this is the Passover weekend. So we want to uh, hear from the Lord what he has for us at this special time of commemoration. I want us to turn our Bibles to um, Exodus chapter 12. That is the second book in the Bible, Exodus chapter 12. I want 14 verses from there. So from verse 1 to 14. But before we do that, I want us to read John chapter 1, verse 29. So John chapter 1, verse 29, then we jump, we go to Exodus um, chapter 12. John chapter 1, verse 29 reads, Thus, as they prepared to go to Exodus chapter 12, it says the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away sin of the world. Let's quickly go to Exodus chapter 12. I want um, from verse 1 to 14. And it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb. According to the house of his father, and a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two door posts and on the lintel of the house where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning. What remains of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, the sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, 
and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and beasts. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. And he says to keep it until uh, all generations. God is a good God. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is you. Your word has power and capacity to change us, to correct us, to rebuke us, to sanctify us, to set us free, to bless us, oh God. We give you praise. We honor you. Your word has been read, oh God. Let it change into spirit, oh God, and touch us from within and change us and motivate us and move us, oh God, to where you want us to move. We sit here to receive Holy Spirit. Touch our ears and our inner ears and our hearts that we may hear what you are saying to the church and change us and move us to the next level. We honor you. We thank you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So I want to talk uh, tonight just briefly uh, from the scriptures which I have read, which are John chapter 1, verse 29, which says, Behold the Lamb of God. And I also want to speak uh, from Exodus chapter 12. And what I've titled my discussion is The Lamb of God and the Shadow, or the Lamb of God and its Shadow. And I have um, just a few things which I want to emphasize even as I begin. I just want to go to the end of the story of what we are talking about and then take you back to the beginning and then move all the way back. So we are going to be talking about this Passover. We are going to be talking about the Lamb of God. We are going to be clarifying how these are connected and how it affects us. Why are we even talking about this? Then we want to talk about the Lamb, the Passover Lamb. Then after that, I want to talk about the plague and the vaccine. Lastly, I want to talk about deliverance. Now, just going back, uh, we said John was baptizing people in the river Jordan. And when he saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. There and then, John already connected Jesus and the Lamb. And we want to see how this affects us or how this came to be. And so we go back now to the story of the children of Israel. They are in the land of captivity. They are in the land of um, bondage. They are in Egypt. Now, we read here this passage of Exodus, which really means exiting or leaving a place. That's what exodus means. It means you are getting out. right? And the children of Israel were getting out of Egypt and going to the promised land. That's why this story or this book is called Exodus. So we are reading from that book when they are now exiting Egypt. They are leaving Egypt now going to the promised land. Now, this Passover period is critical to many religions. It is front, back, and center for us as children of God, as people who are following Christ and we are called Christians. This Passover is a critical moment and we want to see how it affects us. People in the Jewish faith too, also they are impacted by this. They call it Passover or Pascha. And Pascha is just the Greek name which means Passover right and of course during time there was a mixture with uh, other pagan practices and they came to call it 
Easter and so forth. But if you read the Bible, you'll not find Easter. you definitely find Passover. Easter is uh, just a term which is now being used uh, for this event. But biblically speaking, Passover is what we are talking about uh, this moment. And this weekend, this weekend becomes a very critical weekend in our uh, Christian calendar for the entire year. This is the plateau. This is the, the high point. So we must understand how Passover began and how it, how it affects us. Here, John is unveiling the ministry of Jesus. Jesus came and he dwelt with us for 30 years. We only see him at baptism. We only see him at 12 years of age. And now we see him at 30 years of age at the baptism. And now he has been baptized. And John is pointing him out. And he is unveiling or launching his ministry. And saying, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. He, this point is very critical because this is the transition from the old to the new. This is where the breakthrough is in terms of God's plan for salvation and God's plan for redemption. God is now sending his son to transition from that dispensation when they were killing animals, when they were slaughtering goats and lambs and heifers and, and bulls and, 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 and turtles and, and doves. They were killing them in, in, in place of people and doing the sin offering. They were offering all these animals in place of their sins. But now we see God sending his only begotten son, Jesus. So this moment is very critical and very crucial, especially for us who are the saved ones. So we see that this is a moment when you go back to Egypt and we go to the children of Israel, this is a moment where they are transitioning from their slavery, from bondage to freedom. This is um, a critical time. It is a change in their life. And this is why the Passover is very critical. This is why the Passover lamb is a critical subject for us to really understand and then only to discover that this lamb is actually Jesus. Now, this is not the first animal to be killed, right? Because we are, we are being told here um, that the children of Israel are supposed to get a lamb and then, you know, use it on this particular night when they are exiting from uh, Egypt. But we go back to Genesis, and we find that when Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they ran away from the presence of God and went to hide under a bush which was still in the presence of the Lord. You see, when we, when we sin, we do sometimes uh, dumb things because we think we can run away from God's presence. No one can run away from God's presence. God sees you wherever you are. David says, even if I make my bed in hell, you are already there. So Adam and Eve hid underneath this bush, and God said, where are you? Not because he was, he didn't know, or he didn't see them. He saw them, but he was asking them to, so that they could ask themselves, that where are we? What are we trying to do? Hide from God? You can't hide from him. Now, we see that God killed an animal. We are not told what animal. He just said God killed an animal when they said, oh, we, we ate that fruit and we are naked and we, you know, we, we were afraid. And, and God said, okay, I know because you have sinned. So he killed an animal and clothed them. This is the first animal or the first reference we hear of an animal being killed. Because when you read, it's only from chapter 7 or 9 when God gives um, people animals to eat. Before then, you read everything else. It says, you eat the herbs. You eat the greens. That's why they were healthy men in those years. The Methuselah was living for 969 years. 
But now we eat all this meat hey, and we perish quickly. Anyway, so, so this is the first animal we hear which was killed. It was killed because Adam and Eve realized they were naked and needed to be covered. And God, I'm sure, took the blood and that blood is what paid for the sin of Adam and Eve. And so our deliverance and the deliverance of everyone else is now coming through the blood. We get to the children of Israel. They are in Egypt. And they went there, if you read the story from Genesis, you know, and Jacob had his four wives and he had 12 sons and had so many daughters. And, you know, Joseph goes into slavery and they say, mine, they don't, they don't even know that Joseph is still alive. They think he's dead. And then they go to Egypt as a way to escape the famine from Canaan. And there they discover that Joseph is, is alive. So Joseph prepares a place for them called Goshen. He negotiates with, with Pharaoh because he was the second in command. God had promoted him. God actually sent him in advance to prepare for his people. So 72 people came from Canaan and they settled in Goshen. They were given that land by their, um, their brother or their son, who is Joseph. So they settled there. They multiplied to a population of almost one and a half to two million people over 400 years. And if you backtrack, this is why I said, I will, I will take you back and then we'll, I'll take you from the beginning and then back and then we'll go back. When you, when you read this story, the Lord God, who had promised Abraham, who told him to move from his country into Canaan, he moved to Canaan, and there God has a covenant with him. And if you read the book of Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, the Lord God promises Abraham that he will give him the land of Canaan. But he says, your descendants shall live in a foreign country for 400 years, and then after 400 years, they will come back. This is 400 years before Moses was born. You see how, God, how good God is. He's a God of covenant. What are we talking about? We're talking about the Lamb of God and its shadow. So we are tracing its roots. Now God made a promise to Abraham that your descendants shall go to a foreign country. They shall multiply after 400 years. They will come out of that bondage and they will not come out empty. They will be blessed. God has already promised you stuff. If he has said it, if it is God who has promised you, if it is God who has said it, it may delay, it may take 400 years, it may take much more, but because he said it, it's coming to you. So hold on to your faith and hold on to your peace. He is a good God. When he promises something, he will keep his promise. So we come to a stage, the children of Israel are more than a million people. They are afflicted by the Egyptians, and the Lord God sends Moses. God always has a plan. The issue with us as human beings is we are so um, impatient to wait for God's plan to unravel. And we think we know it all, and yet God doesn't reveal his entire plan at one time. God will give us bits and pieces so that we keep on holding and believing and trusting and following him. Now, 400 years, God sends Moses to set free the children of Israel in Egypt. And he goes there and all kinds of plagues break out. So this coronavirus is not the first kind of a plague which has broken out to humanity. Many plagues broke out before. In fact, just a hundred years ago, the plague of influenza broke, broke out. They call it the Spanish flu. It broke out even to our parts of the world, Southern Africa there. Before my, my grandparents were alive, and my, my, my parents were just being born then, and if they narrate or they tell you the stories which happened, many people perished. But God protected them. I am evidence that God protected them because I'm still here. God is a good God. He will keep us and protect us from this plague, this coronavirus. Even as he protected the children of Israel, many plagues came. You know, the blood, the lice, the flies, the frogs, and everything else. 
But in the land of Goshen, it was the secret place. It was the dwelling place of the children of Israel. They dwelt under the feathers of the Almighty. Just like the Lord is protecting you and me during this season and during this time. And we must call on his name. We must praise him. We must worship him. We must thank him because he is a good God. Amen. Now he comes to the children of Israel. He comes to Moses and to Aaron. God always has a leadership structure. He's a God of order. So he comes to Moses and Aaron and he says, Tell the children of Israel that this month shall be the beginning of your year. And the 14th day shall be the beginning of your new month. God didn't care that they were in the third month. They were in the month called Chislev, which is like April or so. But God said, no, it's not like the middle of the, this is the beginning of the year. The Lord is always doing a, a new thing. And when God does this, thing, he doesn't care what the world will say. He doesn't even have to follow the structures of the world. That's why sometimes we appear to be weird and queer because we do not necessarily conform to the ways of the world. He says, be transformed in your, in your mind by the word of God. Do not be conformed to this world. The Lord is always doing a new thing. It is incumbent upon you and me to watch out, to look out, to see what the Lord is doing. Because the Lord is always doing a new thing. He comes to Moses and he says, 400 years is enough. This is the beginning of the new year. So the Lord is doing a new thing even in, in this season. Even as this virus is rampant, the Lord is beginning a new season. The Lord is doing something. And he says, will you not see it as he speaks to Isaiah? So he says, he's a God who speaks even though you are in bondage. He could have waited and said, no, I want them to be free first before I speak. But he spoke to the children of Israel while they were in bondage. The Lord will speak to you even during coronavirus, even in bondage, even in suffering, even when things are very difficult and challenging. The Lord will speak. And he spoke uh, to the children of Israel. And he says, take a lamb. He comes now with his plan of redemption. Sometimes God's instructions are a little bit challenging. Here you are in bondage and slavery, and God says, take a lamb. You're like, take a lamb? I thought you'd say, work on a boat because you're going to be crossing the Red Sea. Take some weapons because you're going to be fighting these Egyptians when they follow you. But he says, no, take a lamb. And he says, this lamb must be a lamb without blemish, which means must not be sporty or speckled. Some of us who grew up on the countryside, we know exactly when you say it should be spotless, what it should be like. Because a lot of our lambs were born with a black head and a white, white body, right? And some even had like pale gold or yellow color on them, you know, and they are sporty. I didn't want any of that. He says, you take a lamb which is a male and which is a year old or less. God's instructions are always very specific and very particular. It's only us who do not want to listen. The Lord God says, I want a blameless, spotless lamb. And that is what I will use as an offering. That is what I will use as a sacrifice. That is what I desire. And this is what the Lord says. He says, you can take it from the sheep or you can take it from the goat. But the Lord is not, a, is not a respecter of persons. The Lord does not discriminate. He takes the goat, he takes the sheep. Just like you and me are from all creed and types and races and ethnicity. God doesn't doesn't discriminate because he's the one who made us. It's only ourselves as human beings that we discriminate against each other. And he says, take it on the 10th day and keep it for four days as you inspect it. Make sure that that lamb has no spot on it. That, that lamb is not physically impaired in any way. That it is suitable, it is blameless, and that it is good. 
And that's the quality of what the Lord is looking for. Our Lord is a Lord of standards. And he is looking for this. And when you read the story of John, when he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he is talking about a spotless Lamb of God. He's talking about this Lamb which came to live with us for 33 years. That Lamb walked among us. And that Lamb had a ministry for three years among us. And this is the spotless Lamb of God. Because the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, it tells us in verse 15 that Jesus is the Lamb of God, that he was tested in all points and yet without sin. He did not sin, even his accusers, when they, they held him before Caiaphas and Pilate, they tried to look for evidence, but it says they could not find anything. They, they, they even brought many witnesses who are written by Matthew as four, many false witnesses came up and accused him of many things, but Caiaphas could not find any fault with him to the extent that he would, he would say, so you say you are the son of God. Now he's, he's trying to provoke Jesus to deny who he is. And he says, you have said it yourself. Then he rents his clothes and you know, becomes angry and says this is blasphemy, so Jesus deserves to die. But Jesus did not sin. This lamb, you would take it, but this lamb was actually a shadow of Jesus. Now the plague had been released on Egypt, and this plague was the final one for the children of Israel to be released from Egypt because Pharaoh had resisted all the other plagues he had really stood and many people had perished, but he was resisting. Now this final one, God says, I'm going to deal with all the firstborns. The firstborn of all the animals and humanity are going to die on this night. And he says, for you in the land of Goshen, for you not to die, this is the plan. Get with the plan. Head a lamb, kill the lamb, take the blood and apply the lamb the two doorposts, right? Which means the two sides of the door. And he says the lintel, which is the upper part of the door. And when you do that, you're actually making a cross. You're making a cross when you put or you apply the blood of the blood of the lamb on the side of the doorpost and on the lintel, which is up there, and then the Blood will be dropping down. You are making a sign of the cross. What's my point? My point is th this is the foreshadowing of the cross of Jesus. The lamb is the foreshadow of Christ. And this doorpost sign is the foreshadow of the cross of Christ. It's already foretold. God goes to the beginning. Then he backs up. You know, and, and it goes to the end of the story. Then he backs up to the beginning to go back. God has already shown us that your sins, that your bondage, that your slavery is going to be ended by this lamb. So the application of the blood is the sign of the cross. And he says, you kill the lamb, you eat the lamb, you take the blood, you apply it on the two doorposts, but do not move out of the house. He say, stay in the house in this night. When you apply the blood of Jesus, stay in the house. Do not move out of the night. Do not move out of the house. Isn't it the same thing which we've been told? Those who dwell in the secret place abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That is what David is talking about. And if the Lamb is Jesus, it means we've got to stay in Jesus for him to save us even during this corona period. You stay in Jesus. You stay inside the house where the blood has been applied and he will pass over you. But he says the death angel is coming. So the plagues have been released. But thank God has already made a plan and a provision for his people like you and me. We're listening to the word of God now. Why? Because God has already made a plan for us. 
for corona and for the judgment to come. God already has a plan, and that plan is Jesus. Jesus, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Listen to what he says. And this is the vaccine for the death. This lamb is the vaccine, and the blood is the vaccine. It's the treatment of the sin nature of the children of Israel. He says, when you eat it, eat it roasted with fire. Do not boil it. And he says, eat it with herbs. It means it's, it's a bitter pill to swallow. But he says, eat it anyway with fire. Roast it with fire. And it's the same thing. The fire and the herbs and all the bitter things which are there are just talking about the cross. Jesus suffering on the cross. He had to take the suffering and that is eating it with herbs, eating it with all these other um, bitter uh, things and eating the flesh roasted with fire. It symbolizes the trials and the tri tribulations which Jesus, you and me, face in this world. And the word of the Lord is very clear. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and 18. It says, do not consider it strange when these fiery trials come to you to try you. He said, you should be happy and you should count yourself uh, highly favored to suffer together with Christ because when he comes and his glory revealed, you shall be with him. Hallelujah. He is a good God. And James also repeats the same remark in James chapter 1, verse 2. He says, count it a joy when you fall into these diverse uh, trials or these numerous and various trials. They were told the children of Israel to eat the meat roasted and this meat must not be boiled, which means you have no time to prepare and cook it nicely. Just roast it on the fire and eat it. And he says, one thing which, which is very important, he says, when you eat it, you don't throw away anything. He says, eat the head, the legs, and the entrails, the intestines, and all the other stuff, eh? and all that, which, which is a delicacy where I come from. I know in other parts of the world, they say, mm, we don't eat this, and yet they eat snails and snakes and all that stuff, you know. So people eat different things, uh, and, and we, we love this. We love the legs. We love the, the head. I remember when I was growing up, you know, when they, when they kill the lamb or, or the goat, you know, the the, my mom would take the head and put it on the on the fire, right? And they would she would spend like two days scraping it and cleaning it out and scraping it and cleaning it out, you know. And then later on, you know, she would uh, cut it into some pieces and then put it in water. And then we would go to the field and leave the pot boiling for the whole day. But here they said, you. Uh, roast it and you eat it. He say, eat the whole thing. What does that symbolize? God wants you whole. He wants your intelligence, your smarts. He wants your money. He wants your dumbness. He wants your thick-headedness. He wants your failures. He wants your laughter. He wants everything which you have because he is the one who has given to you. So don't leave anything else uh, out because God wants to be Lord of all or, at all or if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. He's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. The, the challenge with us as Christians is some of us know Jesus as Savior. Oh, he saved me from my sins. He washed my sins. So I'm going to heaven. Yes, indeed you are. But there's also another part. He is also Lord. He, Lord, the Lord's command, they don't beg you. The Lord gives instructions and commandments and say, Thy shall pay tithes. And then, lo and behold, it comes out the difference is just like that. Because the, if, if he's not Lord, you say, No, 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 I'm not giving my money. I'm not doing that. You save me, I'm going to heaven anyway. So that's all I like. Yes, you're going to heaven. But what it means is you are being challenged to 
when you obey him as Lord, this is why he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and everything else will follow. You find your things flow. You find that worshiping God will not be a pain. You find that you are not grieving and mourning when you, when you worship Jesus, when you follow him, when you live your life. Why? Because you are living it under the lordship of Jesus. There are Christians who are, they are saved. They have a savior who is Jesus, but they are not following him as Lord. So they struggle in their following Jesus. They struggle in their Christianity. Jesus says, you do this. You give this to your brother. He says, mm, no, my car is too, too good. I can't give that away. No, no, I buy them another one, then give it away. Yet the Lord is saying, give it away. He says, give away that to them. He says, mm -mm, no, ain't no way. I can't. I mean, this is the only one I have. This is nice. This is, let me tell you something. I, 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 I had a very nice suit. And that suit was stolen right there in my wardrobe. I couldn't find it for two years. I was looking for my suit. And sometimes it's because God tells you to give it away and you don't. Anyway, thank God. Uh, whoever took it uh, brought it back some years later. God is a good God. Amen. God wants the whole of you. He wants to protect you. So sometimes when he's making demands, it's simply because he wants to bless you. But if you don't listen, mm, then you are going to suffer some things. Listen to what he says. He says you must he gives so meticulous instructions. He says, you eat the whole thing, but when you eat it, make sure your shoes, you dressed up, your shoes are on. Make sure your belt is on. Make sure you have your stuff. Make sure you are ready to exit. That's the way we must live here on earth, because we don't know. Coronavirus is hitting people left, right, and center. And the Lord might decide to take you home with corona. So don't fool yourself and say, well, it's only those who are not saved who are going to die with corona. No, 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 it doesn't say that. Because bad things still happen to good people. You know that. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. So even bad stuff like job happens to good people. Right? The Lord may desire that you come home. And what's my point? My point is, are you sure that you are, you know, Showed it with, 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 with your sandals and your belt and your stuff and you are ready to go. Should the Lord call you to home tonight? Are you ready? This is the instruction the children of Israel are being given. Why? Because they are preparing to exit Egypt. They are preparing to cross the Red Sea. They don't even know how they are going to cross it anyway. Because they have not come there yet. So you may not know your entire way through. But the Lord has a way. The Lord has a plan. So be ready. Make sure that your sandals are on or they, the sandals are, are explained later on when somebody is talking about the armor of God. They are explained as the preparation of the gospel. Are you ready to take the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? And he says the belt of truth. And he says the, the rod or the staff. So he's equipping us, making sure that we are ready. If he decides to call us home or if he decides to move us to an higher dimension or a different dispensation the lord said be ready that is what he's saying to the children of israel here be ready so when the plague comes when judgment is going to be executed when the death angel comes he will see the blood the blood is the sign he says the blood is the sign and when i see the blood i will pass over you this is all we are talking about the lamb of god the blood of jesus is it applied to you when the lord looks at you does he see the blood of jesus Oh, he sees you. And if he sees you, oh, lo and behold, you are done for. You are done for. He says, the blood shall be the sign on your houses. When I see the blood, I shall pass over you. Deliverance is through the blood of Jesus. Why? Because when you go back to Leviticus, he says, life is in the blood. That's why God could not just sow other pieces of leaves and clothe Adam and Eve when they sinned. Because they had lost their life. They, are, they were spiritually dead. That's when they spiritually, they died. 
So they needed revival. And the Lord needed blood to be expensed or to be dispensed in their place. That's why he had to kill an animal. And he says, life is in the blood. And he says in Deuteronomy, he says, the atonement of souls is in the blood. This means the redemption or the forgiveness of sins is in the blood. And in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, he says, without the shedding of the blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sin. So without the blood of the lamb, no sin can be forgiven. We are in our sins. But because the lamb was killed in Egypt, this lamb was a shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the lamb of God who takes away uh, the sin of the world. Now the death angel is coming. And the firstborns are going. Unless if you have the blood of Jesus. And Jesus is our Passover lamb. Jesus is the ultimate fruitfulness which we are talking about. It's divine providence. Jesus is provided by God for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And there is a pressing there. And Jesus is killed. He really doesn't want to go. And he prays three times, my Lord, my Lord, if this cup can pass, but let it not be your will. There is a pressing there. There will come pressing moments for you and me. And Jesus is matured to realize that there is no other way except the way of God. He says, let your will be done. And Jesus goes as the ultimate sacrifice, being fruitful, being fruitful and fulfilling God's plan for salvation. Jesus is the lamb to save you and me. That's all I'm saying. Jesus is the lamb of God that was killed on this particular night, which is the night we are in to save you and me. Is your household covered? Remember what he says. He says, take a lamb which is adequate for your household. If your household is small, join up with your neighbor. So this is not this message is not just for you and me, but for our neighbors and for the whole world. God is saying, Are you covered by the blood of Jesus? Let me invite you now to take Jesus as the Lamb of God and to apply his blood over yourself and over your family even as we are commemorating, as we are remembering the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. This is a commemoration. Jesus already died. Jesus already rose. He's seated on the right hand of the Father. But we take out this time to remember the sacrifice, what he did for us, which he began in Egypt, showing the children of Israel and illustrating with lambs that he was to come is the ultimate lamb of God which takes away our sin. Now it's you and me. It's no longer about the children of Israel. It's no longer about the descendants of Jacob. It's no longer about the descendants of Abraham. It's about you and me. Do you have the blood of Jesus? Do you have the lamb of God? If he were to call you home tonight, are you ready to meet him? He says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Do you have the blood of Jesus? Putting it plainly, I'm saying, are you saved? Yes, you acknowledge Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord. And that is the requirement. That's all you need to do, to acknowledge him, that you are my Savior, that I am a sinner, that I need you, Jesus, that I cannot save myself, that your blood is what cleanses me, and I apply it by faith, and I receive the forgiveness of my sins and I begin a new life in Jesus. Let me invite you at this moment as I call the praise and worship. Let me invite you to take this moment to introspect, to think deeply and, and check yourself. Where are you in your relationship with the Lord. This is judgment night. The angel of death is passing by. If he does not see the blood of the lamb, 
He goes in there to kill the firstborn. And I'm saying judgments, God has pronounced judgments. It's a series of judgments. When the, when, when the cup of sin fills up, God sends a judgment. And who knows, maybe this corona is also another judgment. God is always judging the world. But the final judgment shall come. And that's the most critical one, which I'm asking you. Are you ready for that final one? Do you have the blood of Jesus? Have you acknowledged Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior? If you have not, bow your head with me so we can pray this sinner's prayer. You say it sincerely. You can send us an email or a message, or you can go to any Bible-believing church next to you and tell them that I have given my life to Jesus and I would like to be part of you so that they continue to train you and to teach you in the ways of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. I come before you, Lord, acknowledging that I am a sinner and that I have sinned. I have no relationship with God. I am coming to you now, confessing my sin, and I say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Wash me with the blood of Jesus. Cleanse me now and give me a new and a cleansed heart. And fill me and anoint me with your Holy Spirit. Uh, and teach me and show me a new way, even as I begin a new life in you, Lord. I thank you that I am saved now. I thank you that, Jesus, I invite you to come and sit and come and dwell in my heart through your Holy Spirit. You and Father God, make your dwelling in me and make me an instrument for your salvation and for your greater works. I thank you. I bless you. Even as I begin a new life, that you shall show me your way. I thank you. I bless you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. So if you have prayed that sinner's prayer, you are now a child of God. You take it by faith. And as I said, our details are on our website. You can send us um, a, a, a message. You can send us an email. And you can go to a Bible-believing church next to you and join with them and begin a new life. Let me...